Hi, I'm Wes. Welcome back to Building Roots with Tree Newell. Today, I'm joined by Emmett from ArborJet, and uh, we're just gonna give you a little talk about common insect pests in North Texas going into the summer, things you ought to look out for, and uh, what's gonna be munching on your trees. Emmett has uh, a lot of experience in plant health care, and uh, he, his company provides plant health products for sale and uh, helps the folks in our industry get the job done. So welcome, Emmett. Thanks for having me on, Wes. Appreciate it. Yeah, good to see you here. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're going into summer. Um, it's May, it gets hot and trees get stressed and we start getting a lot more insect pests around here. Um, you know, around here we've got different times of seasons where we've got lots of different insect pests changing all the time. and. Uh, summer is a hard one for some of our trees. Um, so what are some of the, the common pests that we see around here that we really need to be on the lookout for this summer? Yeah, so when DFW, well, yes, there are insect pests in the summer, but it's also a fun time to be out scouting for trees and finding these things. Uh, there's a few of them that are really common. Uh, crate myrtle bark scale is probably the most common landscape pest that you're gonna see out there. Uh, it's on pretty much all the crepe myrtles. Pretty much all crepe myrtles. And so what's interesting is, you know, for me being on this side, you know, I've been with ArborJet for about nine years. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I was a plant healthcare manager for Dallas Area Tree Care Company. And that was like 2010 to 2014. I was right when it was building up. Yes. And so crepe myrtle bark scale, I have treated thousands of crepe myrtles for that pest. Yep. And now as a homeowner, I've got just planted a couple of more. Uh, I have several great myrtles at my house. <laughs> Making some work for yourself. And, uh, you know, I was looking at them yesterday or this past weekend, mm -hmm. and I was actually pointing out to my wife, I was like, oh, see that up there? See that white stuff? That's the scale insects. Yep. But then I saw, it looks like a mealy bug, but it's actually- Mealy bug destroyer. It's the, uh, it's a white, I forget the scientific name, but it's a ladybug larva mm -hmm. for the, twice stabbed lady beetle, it's black with two red spots. Yep. And I saw its larva up there with the scale. And yes. yeah, so it's, a, it's gonna eat them, it's a beneficial insect. Right. And so kind of what I've seen over the years from treating thousands of crepe myrtles to now having my own at my house, I feel like the predator has caught up to the pest in terms of population. I feel like the predators are doing a better job. Well, the predators do a pretty good job in, in a lot of cases. It seems like there's certain varieties that they prefer better than others. Uh, I see Natchez crepe myrtles or some of the little dwarf ones like dynamite that have the red flowers. Mm -hmm. They tend to get heavily infested. Even the really small, the ultra dwarfs, I've had to treat those multiple times a season it just doesn't seem like the insecticide has as long of a residual on it, but they also get covered up in aphids. Yeah. Um, but you're right, the, the predators are definitely good to have around. I like to show my customers signs of the, the beneficial predators. Sometimes you'll find groups of pupil cases mm -hmm. on the trunk for the ladybugs, or you'll find green lacewing eggs. Um, and so it's nice to have that uh, as a kind of a visual aid. And, and you can tell the customer that, look, if the predators uh, didn't have food, they wouldn't be here. It's just a sign that, that you're infested. And um, it's also a good uh, segue into using systemic insecticides or, or non-toxic methods that right. are softer on our beneficials. Yeah, what's uh, the pupil casings of the ladybug larva. I remember I had a customer, this is back when I was treating trees, a uh, person sent me a picture what is this? They were freaked out because they had the, the pupil casings, the exoskeletons mm -hmm. from the molting uh, attached to their trunk. And they were like, what is this? Oh my God, what's on my tree? It and, looks like something out of an alien movie. You're right. Um, but it was a good thing. Yeah, and so, it is a good thing. Uh, crate myrtle bark scale, that's probably the main thing. It started in Richardson back in 2004. And so, but it's, it's fascinating with that scale, it spread very quickly throughout the United States and really the yeah. Southeast. I imagine on nursery stock, but well, That's, it spreads fast around here too, I think, because everybody's got grape myrtles. Yes. It's pretty easy for it to get around. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then you touched on the aphids, but um, controlling crate myrtle bark scale, the neonicotinoid insecticides work very well. So that's things uh, like imidacloprid, people know it as merit, right. and then dinotefurin, people know that as safari or xylam. Uh, and I'm sure there's others out there. 
Uh, those are very good at controlling piercing sucking insects. The, mm -hmm. the problem that I have, and I've kind of come from a different standpoint being on, you know, a manufacturer side of the industry and not a, a practicing uh, plant healthcare person anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the neonicotinoids, they're under a lot of pressure from EPA on bees. They've gotten some bad publici uh, publicity for right. sure. So. Yeah, and so crepe myrtles being flowering shrubs, you know, they start flowering in June and they basically flower all summer. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of get into a moral dilemma of, do we use a neonicotinoid on these or not? So what other alternatives are there? So there's some very effective insect growth regulators for scale. Mm -hmm. uh, the one I'm familiar with is Distance. Mm -hmm. and this is not a product that I make uh, right. or ArborJet makes. I should clarify, ArborJet is not my company. It's the company I work for. Um, it's not one of our products. I think it's made by, I want to say Valent. It is a Valent product, yes. Distance, it's a insect growth regulator that is specific to scale insects. I've used it with great effect on armored scales, which can yes. be very difficult to control Correct. with other insecticides, um, specifically on palms. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes these palm scales will come out on the fronds as the fronds are emerging and you can't get to them in uh, with traditional insecticides in a lot of time uh, and the way that we normally would apply them. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're actually inside the heart of the plant. And uh, I had some great success using distance. Uh, have you guys used it on crepe myrtle bark scale? I have on certain occasions. Um, I have also used, um, what's the, TriStar, I've used TriStar okay. on it. And um, sometimes we even do a horticultural oil in the winter, just as a kind of preventative measure. Right. So, and, and beneficial insect releases can also be an option. Yeah, in the right, uh, in the right setting. I believe the, the Dallas Arboretum, I think they have a pretty extensive use of beneficials uh, yes. in their program, but the, it's the something challenge, I think we all should be looking at. Yeah, the challenge with them is they fly away. And so, they do. you know, my wife, she, uh, my wife homeschools our boys. And so she's teaching them about insects and plants and things like that. And she was wanting to buy some, some ladybugs. We're having some aphids and like I mentioned the scale. And she's like, should we get some? And I'm like, well, they're just going to go all over the neighborhood. They're, <laughs> they're not going to stay here. So right. whether they work, and that's the thing with a lot of the properties here in DFW is we have small lots. And so... Maybe if you're on a state or something like that, those beneficials can be a, a pretty useful in an IPM strategy, but in smaller lots, I don't know how effective it's well, going to be. Well, if you can release larva onto the tree, yeah, they true. are not as mobile as right. the adults and they'll just crawl up and find the pests and yeah. munch on them. It is the impressive. adults do just disperse a it lot It is more impressive easily. how much those larvae can eat. Yes, they're voracious. Yeah. All right, so let's see. Scale insects, so you, you mentioned Armored scale. Armored scales, yeah. Um, that's one, that's another very common pest, uh, especially on our oaks around here. Lots of obscure scales. Yes. I see a lot of gloomy scales on maples, right. sometimes even on sweet gums and mm -hmm. hackberries, but usually on maples. Yeah. And so armored scales are difficult to control with systemics mm -hmm. um, as opposed to soft scales. And the, the main thing that I teach people about on those is how to tell the difference Soft scales produce honeydew, right. armored scales do not. And right. so, uh, you know, to homeowners, if they have a honeydew problem, which is the, the sticky stuff that, if you've ever parked under a tree and get the sticky stuff on your windshield or on your hood, that's honeydew. And that's a indication that that tree may have scale or aphids or some other piercing sucking insect feeding on yeah. it. Whereas the armored scales don't produce that and they're gonna be really camouflaged. And that's something that might take a professional to, to right. find and diagnose. Uh, even the symptoms of, of armored scale are very discreet. And to the untrained eye, you, you wouldn't even know there's a problem there. A lot of times my customers look at the tree and think, oh, I just thought that was part of the tree. Right. It looked like a lenticel or part of the bark. Right. And it can be difficult to detect. But I tell my customers that if you've got, you know, a few hundred of them on a tree, it's not that big a deal. But if you've got a few hundred thousand on right. a tree, it's death by paper cuts. Yes. Yeah, they're very de debilitating insects. And so uh, back on that distance insecticide, I, that's something, like I said, it's not mine. I don't have any experience using it, but I've attended some some lectures about it. And I'm like, man, that sounds really great. I think it's got a, a B box on it where on the label where it says it's, you know, safe to use on, you know, it's not going to harm bees, basically. Right. Yeah. And so my, 
you know, coming from being a, an applicator back in my early career to now, you know, nine, 10 years later, my kind of ideas on controlling insect pests in the landscape have really evolved. And I think for the better, you know, I talk to people about IPM, integrative pest management. Yes. And using the right tool, using a toolbox approach, using the right tool for the job. And mm -hmm. the least effective, uh, excuse me, the least toxic method that's going to get the desired results. Correct. And waiting until you've got a damaging population yes. to treat and not just spraying everything in the yard just yes. to kill every insect with yes. broad spectrum insecticides. I think we all can agree in, in our industry, you know, all the research shows that that's actually counterproductive. Right. And so that's something, you know, in my role now, I go and I visit with tree care companies, landscape companies, lawn care companies. And uh, earlier this spring, I met with a couple of different lawn care companies in Oklahoma. And they were like, we want your help with our tree and shrub program. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what are you guys doing now? And they laid it out to me. They're, they're five or six rounds that they're doing for tree and shrub. And, you know, they're doing three, like round one is a dormant oil spray. Round two was a broad spectrum insect and disease spray. Round three was the same thing. Round four was another broad spectrum spray. Gonna build up some resistance. And, you know, so they laid this out to me. I said, okay, guys, I'm going to rip this thing apart because that's the opposite of what you want to be doing. Right. That's the opposite of integrative pest management. Right. I think for homeowners in this area, they need to be aware of the differences between the service that a professional tree care company or a professional arborist is going to offer versus what they're getting from their lawn care company. Right. Well, the professional arborist is going to be able to scout and be able to scan the property and to look for the, the key pests that are going to be on the key plants and know how best to treat those in an IPM way that's not gonna have you know, non-target species effects that we're not looking for. Right. Uh, but that takes skill, knowledge, expertise. Yes. Uh, it, it's prescribing the right treatment is, is more than just, oh, here's your program, let's spray everything. Y you right. really need to know the, the biology of the plant that you're treating, the biology of the pest that you're treating, the the way that the product that you prescribe works to be able to understand the whole situation and make the best prescription because otherwise you're either wasting money or you're hurting things you're not intending to right and that's that's a challenge so as we continue to talk about scale insects you know there's a bunch of different species out there and they all have different life cycles yep like the obscure scale i believe their crawlers are out like in the middle of summer August, I think, is when the when they come out. Uh, and then another common soft scale is Lacinium scale. And I'm like, when are their crawlers out? They're in the spring. In the spring. Mm -hmm. um, crate myrtle bark scale. <clears throat> those multiple are coming. Multiple generations. Multiple generations. They're out early. Right. Um, which, yeah. which I think makes, because those are a felt scale, I think that distance would work really well on them as a, as a spray. Mm-hmm because their crawlers are gonna be out and they're gonna have nymphs out. So I, I feel like that would be a good approach. Yeah, and even the neonicotinoids, which you brought up earlier, are, are effective when used according to label directions, right? right? Um, they, any label. product can be used safely when you have it in the hands of the right applicator that really understands the product and how it's labeled for application to get the best results. Yeah. All right, so more so, in, more insects oh, coming up, bagworms. Bagworms are hot. They're getting hot right now. Usually mid-May is when we start seeing them pop out. They can chew up some evergreens in a hurry. Uh, some years it seems like they're really heavy in population. Mm -hmm. And then other years it seems like we don't see very many. Yeah, uh, that's cyclical nature of, of insects, I think, is probably a survival mechanism you know it's one generation per year but that doesn't mean all the eggs hatch every year right well th at least we do know that we know that there's always one generation per year and that they always come in may or early june mm -hmm. so if you can go ahead and get your treatment uh at that time when they start to become active you know you're done with it for the year correct and so bagworms depending on where you're at in the metroplex may be an issue or maybe not you know if you're down in dallas proper or you know, uh, old part of Fort Worth or something like that. You may not see them in your landscape, but as you get out into the more newly developed areas, so 
on the Dallas side, if you're in Allen, Fairview, uh, parts of McKinney, if you get north into Melissa and Anna, where there's lots of native cedars, you're probably going to be seeing this pest. Right. Uh, and then on the Fort Worth side, where you guys are, you're in Argyle, so you probably have a fair amount in Argyle. I do. Um, up Denton, west of Denton. I don't even know. The, the yeah. Metroplex has just gone crazy with uh, development. It, so. it has. It has. And, and, and people can identify when they've got them by looking for the little cocoons right. that are on the, usually toward the tips of the branches. Sometimes they're farther back in the branch. But uh, the, the caterpillar uses bits of the leaves as he builds his cocoon to camouflage it. And so it just contains the foliage of whatever plant they happen to be feeding on. Right. So sometimes Japanese maples, get them. They, they'll get on everything. Yeah. Um, so they hatch out of the, they overwinter as an egg. So right. they, you're going to find on your, they like evergreen. So Leland Cypress, I think is their favorite food. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll find an old bag somewhere in the canopy of that Leland Cypress. It'll yep. be, I don't know, about this long. The eggs are in there. And so when they hatch out in late May, early June, they will be a proliferation of you know small caterpillars in their little bags mm -hmm. right near that old one and yep. the the little ones they might be like the size of your small fingernail you see them twitching in there you can see yep. the cocoons actually twitching and then you can see them coming out of the top of their bag right. coming out to feed and then they build their cocoon as they get older and right. make it larger as they go and so they camouflage really well and most people won't even know that they're a problem until later instars of that pest when they're consuming lots of foliage uh, every single day and they'll eat those trees to the ground. I've seen them eat Leland Cypress to the ground. I've seen them eat Arborvitae to the ground. Spartans, yes. Eastern Red Cedars, Bald Cypress. Yeah. They have a wide palate. Yes, they do. Uh, in heavy populations, I've seen them hanging off of gutters of people's yes. houses. On the eaves and on the bricks. Yeah, yes. they get all over everything. Yep. And so, depending on the infestation level, back to IPM, mm -hmm. uh, that'll dictate the method of, of control. And right. so, um, you know, a homeowner, I have two little uh, Blue Point Junipers at my house. And mm -hmm. I was looking at them the other day and I saw an old bag back inside of there. And if you can find those bags now before they hatch, it's practical that you could pick those off because yeah. their eggs are inside of there. So collect those old ones and, and discard them. And that should eliminate the pest. It's easier to do on smaller trees. Yes, absolutely. A lot of times you need professional help when you've got it on a big tree and it's just not practical or, or, or safe getting up on a ladder. Yeah, or if there's hundreds of them, it, yes. might, it might be uh, it's well, like trying to pull all the weeds out of your yard. Right, right. You think you could do it, but yeah. there's too many. Well, an, another common pest that we've got around here that should be gearing up uh, with the heat and the typical drought that we have are wood boring insects. Absolutely. And you know, that's a broad term that covers a lot of different insects, a lot of different types of wood borers. Um, we've got everything from beetle larva to moth larva that actually will chew into wood and, and damage our trees from the inside. But uh, we see a lot of them when, when our trees get drought stressed. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had a terrible heat wave. We had a lot of, lot of drought. It was a really rough summer. And we had a heavy population of wood boring insects. And I wouldn't be surprised if we have the same thing this year. Um, so what are some of the most common ones that you see and what, um, what kind of kicks them off? Yeah, so wood borers, they're kind of endemic. So you've got, you've got your native wood boring pests. Uh, and then also we have an invasive wood boring pest now, emerald ash borer, that's, yep. uh, was found in Fort Worth back in 2018, uh, was found in Denton County in 2020, and then popped up in three locations in Dallas County last year. I also recently got confirmation that it was observed in South Lake. South Lake, okay, yes. that's that's new. It's also found in Parker County in, in Hudson Oaks out yes. west of Fort Worth. So uh, it is on the move, yep. like from the first location in 2018 to, and I imagine it's gonna be found in more Dallas counties uh, in other places in Tarrant County um this year so we can we could we could do a whole podcast on eab we could we don't need to but so eab is here um native wood borer so you've got if you show me a mature red oak i'd bet money that there's probably carpenter worms in there somewhere yes um carpenter worms are a large lepidoptera larva 
Um, I've got an old picture somewhere. I mean, they'll, they'll be as long as your finger inside of a tree. Um, they're kind of interesting. They'll, they'll chew into the heartwood of a tree and climb around in there and chew it up. And then they'll come out, they'll exit through the sapwood and they'll leave their pupil casing in their exit hole. Uh, and they turn into a moth as an adult. And so you'll always see that pupil casing stuck in the exit mm -hmm. hole. Uh, that's a common one. You mentioned drought. So in certain areas where there are pine trees in the Metroplex, so I'm thinking uh, kind of like Lake Dallas, Corinth, uh, and then sort of out towards Argyle and uh, not Grapevine, but that South Lake area mm -hmm. where there's pines. Under drought conditions, that'll, they'll be susceptible to the Ips and Graver bark beetle, which is a type of pine bark beetle. Yep. Um, and what are the signs of that? Uh, the signs of that one, you're going to see your tree fading. And what I mean by that, so a healthy pine is going to be dark green. When they get under attack by bark beetles, which chews up the vascular system that's transporting the water, uh, that tree will begin to fade from dark green to a pale green, to a yellow, to a red. Right. And uh, a, the mm -hmm. thing with bark beetles, what's tricky is once you start to see the symptoms, like once you see it turn yellow, it's kind of too late and what you need to be preparing is to treat the trees that are nearby right because bark beetles uh, they're kind of fascinating insects and that's actually where so our product triage which is what put arborjet on the map as a company um, triage lasts for two years and has very very effective control of wood boring pests um, it started with bark beetles and so we did research with the texas forest service uh, bark beetles are attracted to pheromones, either by the plants or other beetles. And so basically those trees get stressed out, the beetles can, can smell that, and they attack that tree. And the more beetles that are in there, they, they're releasing pheromones also. And so other beetles smell that, yep. and they're like, hey, there's a party over here. Right. And so they all jump on this tree that's stressed out and they kill it. And so the adult beetles burrow through the bark, colonize underneath the bark, lay eggs, and then uh, the larvae come kind of fan out from this larval chamber. Uh, and so the, the galleries are real fan, they're kind of fan shaped. And so depending on the, the type of beetle. And so those, those larvae will come out, do their damage, and then they hatch out and they're gonna go find another tree to get on. They can do a lot of damage in a short period of time. Uh, they're, they're eating vascular tissue, it makes it difficult for the tree to, uh, to bring sugars down to the roots. And if the sugars aren't getting to the roots, the roots don't create energy, the leaves create energy. Mm -hmm. so if the roots don't get energy from the canopy, stops up taking water, the whole system breaks down and the whole thing ends up crashing. All right. So our, on pine, so you wanna, be, you wanna be on the lookout for fading and with Ips and Graver beetles, they only, or I shouldn't say they only, they mostly attract, uh, uh, mostly attack drought stressed trees and so you're gonna see sawdust associated with those. Uh, pines produce resin, as you know, for that's actually a defense compound. And so as a beetle tries to burrow into a pine, that resin that it produces is supposed to push out the beetle. Mm -hmm. Well, with Ips, when trees are drought stressed, they don't have that resin to, to function. The other thing is it's gonna be the tops of pines. So what's kind of fascinating, bark beetles range in size from large, so out in East Texas, you'll find black turpentine beetle and red turpentine beetle. Those will hit low down on the trunk of the tree versus Ips, which is the smallest species. The larger the beetle is, the, it can't fly as high. So if, if the beetle is small, it can fly higher. And so the Ips will hit higher up and then your larger beetles will hit lower down on the tree. And so Ips will primarily kill out the top of a tree. Uh, and then so the, the larger beetles, they'll hit low down and uh, girdle the tree. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you mentioned uh, your product triage, which is imamectin benzoate. Correct. Um, how does that typically apply it? I mean, we're, we're looking for things that are uh, very effective, but have minimal impacts on our non-targets. Right. And so that's really the, the what Arborjet was founded on as a company is being environmentally responsible for our with our products. And so most of our chemistries are applied through a trunk injection, 
where we're able to use very low doses of chemistry, chemistry and it's all sealed inside the tree. Mm -hmm. So we're injecting these systemic products inside the tree's vascular system. And as that tree is transporting water uh, to the canopy, these products hitch a ride basically. And so what's unique about imamectin benzoate in, in our product triage, or we have two triage products, um, is it's a true systemic. And so we're injecting it into the xylem, which is moving things up. And this chemical will actually load into the phloem of the tree and be transported back down. And so with your wood boring pests, you have uh, phloem feeders as well. And that's where, so like emerald ash borer is a right. phloem feeding borer. And so it's important to have that chemical in the right spot. And so as that compares to other systemics like imidacloprid, I call that a one-way systemic. Imidacloprid mm -hmm. and dinotefurin, they go into the xylem, they get transported up and their final destination is the foliage and they're right. gonna stay there. And that, for some insects, that's what you want to happen. For sucking pests, exactly. that's helpful. But chewing pests is not as helpful. Right, so with wood borers, and that's where we get this unique two year of coverage, uh, which is, is really, uh, you know, this was introduced a while back, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool. <laughs> you can I get tell two my years customers, of coverage. I tell my customers it it goes up in the xylem, it comes down in the phloem, and it coats the whole thing on the inside like Pepto Bismol. Okay, they like that. I've, I've never. They used know that what Pepto Bismol <laughs> is and how it, the one that coats is the only one you need. Okay, right? it works. All right. Well, if that if that's helping you, um, <laughs> I've not ever used Just that one. Analogies work great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, other pests of pines, um, the Zimmerman pine moth. I'm sure that's one you've seen. Yes. So Zimmerman pine moth, we're gonna see that on uh, Japanese black pine and Austrian pine, also on uh, uh, Elderica pine, mm -hmm. also known as Afghan pine. Yes. And so that, I call it popcorn. You're gonna see this large or candle wax. You're gonna see this candle wax looking structure, usually uh, where a limb is attached on a crotch of a tree. And you're gonna see that come out. That's another Lepidoptera borer. They have three generations each year. Um, again, treatable with, with the triage products. Well, but because they have multiple generations per year is one of the reasons you need the long residual Correct. control. Additionally, the trees are being attacked because they're stressed. Mm -hmm. Having a long residual control gives us as tree managers an opportunity to start correcting the deficiencies, whatever's yes. creating the stress, and to help that tree come out of the stress so that by the time the product has lost its efficacy, we're no longer worried about it getting reinfested right. optimally. Yes, and, and that long window, that, that opens up your treatment window as well. So on the scale insects where we're talking about using sprays and, and various other methods of treating, you've got to know the life cycle of that insect, when the crawlers are out, when it's an egg, things like that. With triage, because it lasts for two years, you can really apply it any time and you know it's still going to be present when that borer is there. And so that's, you know, I touched on carpenter worms early earlier and how they might be in the heartwood for a while. Well, no systemic is gonna be in the heartwood. Right. And so with triage, I can treat that tree and know whenever that insect is coming out through the xylem and then out through the phloem, through the bark, uh, that triage will be there and it'll take care of that insect. Yes, so uh, we talked about borers, we've talked about uh, bark scales, armored scales. Um, I think spider mites is another big yes. one that uh, with the heat, summer coming on, that's one that people really got to be on the lookout for because their their life cycle shortens as the temperature goes up and their populations can increase very rapidly to a damaging population. Uh, what would you say are some of the most common species you see spider mites on? Uh, junipers, so any type of ornamental juniper and Italian cypress. They're like magnets yep. for spider mites. Yeah, and then also you'll see them on roses and other ornamentals. Yeah, I see them on magnolias. I see them mm -hmm. a lot on oak yep. trees, yep. Uh, cedar elms. Yep. Um, and sometimes when the population gets real heavy, uh, they can cause some pretty significant defoliation. Yeah, so what's you mentioned oak trees. So it's funny, um, live oaks, mm -hmm. it's mo probably the most common species in North Texas is the live oak. Very common. And the in the winter months, the live oaks, they keep their they keep their leaves until they put out new leaves. In the winter months, live oaks will kind of have this bronze color to them. And I remember people, you know, homeowners would say, Oh, that's you know, that's the fall coloring of a live oak. 
And I'm like, no, that's because they're <laughs> loaded with spider mites. You know, the fall color of a live oak is dark green. Right. They're supposed to be dark green all the time. And so if, if you see that bronze color, because what spider mites are doing is they're eating the chlorophyll out of the leaf. And mm -hmm. so you're going to see kind of this browning or bronzing, sort of a dusty appearance on, on the foliage. That's an indicator of spider mites. And you also bring up a good point. Yes, we can have big population spikes in the in the summer during the hot season, but we also have cool season mites. Correct. That can be a big problem when you least expect to have a problem with spider mites. Yeah. Uh, so how do you know when you got a spider mite infestation? Yeah, so look for the that dusty coloring. And then if you have uh, junipers or uh, the Italian cypress, a good test, you take a white sheet of paper mm -hmm. and just take one of those branches and slap it on the white sheet of paper. And then sometimes you might need a magnifying glass uh, but if you've got a keen eye, you can usually see the eggs or actually the spider mites crawling around on that white piece of paper. Yeah. I've got some pretty cool little videos that I took with my cell phone with a little um, plastic magnifier that I put over the camera lens. Mm -hmm. And I did an up close on a live oak leaf. And you could see the little spider mites and the eggs and everything on the leaf. And... Uh, so there, but there's other ways. So the stippling on the leaf surface, right. uh, a loss of uh, color in the plant, just a general haze. I find that uh, you know most plants have nice, a, a glossy kind of appearance, especially you know ones that have a thicker waxy coating, mm -hmm. um, and the mites kind of give it a dull appearance. Sometimes you can even see webbing on certain plants. Yeah. Yes, uh, I saw that on one of my roses already. Yes. Um, thick webbing. Yes. Uh, on, on the under. What's tricky is they're on the underside of the leaf. And so mm -hmm. they can be difficult to manage. And depending on the situation, uh, sprays may be in order. There's there's various different products out there for, for spraying mites. Um, and it's important to rotate those sprays in your program because mites are one of those pests that can build up resistance very, very quickly. Yes, because they're short life cycle. Mm -hmm. Anything with a real short life cycle is gonna have a greater ability to become resistant to our control methods uh, if, if we're not careful. Yeah, and so uh, like talking, those companies in Oklahoma I mentioned that are doing broadcast sprays, they're mm -hmm. using the same stuff over and over again and yep. you get, Mites are one of those pests that you get pest resurgence very quickly. When you do a broadcast spray, it's gonna kill those predators that we talked about. Yes. And the mites are so small that you, with a spray application, you're never gonna get, really with any application, you're never gonna get 100%. And so whatever gets left behind, well, now there's no predators. And so they just, the pest population always resurges a lot faster than the, than the predator population. Which brings us back to our IPM conversation yes. earlier on why it's, you know, one of the big mistakes that a lot of companies make when they're treating for insects or disease is by not being specific enough. Right. Most of our products tend to be pretty specific to a certain type of pest or really the way that that pest feeds. And, and that's kind of how we know what we need to prescribe based on the biology of that pest and the way that the product works. Right, so, um, you know, certain species, a spray may be in order. And actually the triage is effective on, on spider mites as well. It's also effective on bagworms, so. Um, Any chewing pests, yeah. all kinds of caterpillars that we right. get. You know, canker so, worms, web worms. Right, so on the, kind of skip, on the bagworms, um, people have asked me, so like bald cypress will get them. That's a good, mm -hmm application for a trunk injection uh, rather than having to spray up into the canopy of a large tree but then other smaller shrubs that might or uh, like hedgerow trees that might be an application where the spray is better on those pests well as a business op owner and operator i much prefer to do a trunk injection or some sort of systemic uh, soil application mm -hmm. as opposed to a spray uh, my, my customers don't really like the sprays their neighbors don't like them. The right. technician doesn't like them. It gets everywhere. You can't do it if it's rainy or it too windy or too hot or too cold. And so there's a lot of restrictions on it that can also impact its efficacy, uh, as well as just the fact that it's real hard to spray a big canopy tree yeah. and get good coverage and know that you're going to get good control. These systemic products kind of take that part out. Yes. All right. So what else on... Oh, spider mites, something we need to talk about. Um, 
plants that are treated with imidacloprid will usually have higher spider mite populations. It's like a supercharging effect on the spider mites. So uh, I attended a lecture about this uh, from Whitney Cranshaw. He's a, he used to be a researcher at Colorado State University. And what the researchers over there have found, I, I found this really fascinating, is that imidacloprid, a neonicotinoid, it actually turns off the plant's uh, defense response. So it down regulates the plant's defenses and so that these insects or these spider mites can feed pretty much unencumbered by the plant. It's and almost so like an immune suppressant. It is. Immunity suppressor. It yeah. suppresses the, the immune system of the plant, if you will. Uh, and so those mites are able to just feed and go crazy. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen it firsthand. Um, I've observed it on on bur oaks, yes, on, it, on live say. oaks, on lots of lots of uh, lots of uh, trees where we have lace bug problems. Yep, and we treat with the metacloprid to control the lace bugs. It does a real good job on the lace bugs, but then the spider mites go crazy. Correct. Yep, that's what I've seen as well. Um, doing a little anecdotal study of my own on so lace bugs. A nice segue. Mm -hmm. uh, past of bur oaks and sycamores around here. Treated some with the metacloprid came back to, to check on them. I couldn't find a lace bug on the tree, but the tree looked terrible because it was just loaded with spider mites. Out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah. And so um, actually we have we have a product called AceJet. The active ingredient is acephate. That works really, really well for controlling the lace bugs and it's effective on spider mites. And so the trees that I had treated with that product, uh, they looked the best. Even though it's a short lived uh, product in the tree, it does such a fantastic job of eradicating pests in the tree um, that when I came back to follow up, the trees look great. And it's also lightning fast. Yes, extremely fast acting. Yes, it's a reliable product for sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, w we've talked about a lot of different pests and uh, different ways of controlling them and what are some of the problems that we see in, in pest control applications. Um, where can customers or residents or anybody that's watching go to get more information? That is a, that's a tricky question. Uh, so Dr. Google, right? And the challenge there is the internet can tell you anything you want it to. And, you know, it's just like WebMD. You get on there because you've got a cough or something. And the next thing you know, you think you're, you're dying. And so you've got to be careful and you kind of have to know how to use the internet uh, the ArborJet website has a lot of good resources, but really the, the best thing to do is to have a, a good arborist company uh, that you can work with and that has familiarity with these pests and, and treatment methods uh, that you can call out. And so um, how, how does Tree Newell do it? You have some sort of an annual plan, right? Where well, we, we do annual inspections where we come out and we scout because we don't want to make uh, treatments on things that don't need them, right? We're yes. not in the business of selling things to people that aren't going to benefit them. So we come out and we're scouting. We like to scout uh, on some some of our properties. We'll, we'll even do quarterly inspections just to make sure that we're staying out in front of things and we're able to be proactive and pre prevent big outbreaks from happening before they become a major problem. Right. Um, we also invite people to come to our website. We've got a tremendous amount of information on there, lots of blog posts. They're gonna talk about a lot of these major pests and uh, what we can do about it. So uh, Emmett, I wanna thank you for joining me here today. Uh, I had a real fun time talking about yeah. trees and, and bugs. It's a, it's a wide world of insects out there and uh, there's a lot to know and it takes a lot of expertise to be able to make the best uh, prescriptions. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciated having you here today and uh, look forward to doing this again. All right, absolutely. Right, thank thanks, you. Wes.